Hello, and welcome to Inside the Outside, the podcast that will take you inside the minds of two very different outdoors people. I'm Gary Kirk. And I'm Christy Kirk, and we're so glad you could join us today. This week, we're going to be talking about what to buy when you're getting started as a hiker or backpacker. And if you've watched the movie, A Walk in the Woods, based on Bill Bryson's book, A Walk in the Woods, or you've read the book, you'll recall the scene where Bill goes into the outfitter store and literally buys every single thing there. And I think that that's a trap all of us fall into at one time or another. You get excited about, you know, a new hobby and you want to buy all of the things before you know which are the things you'll need. There are so many gadgets out there, uh, so many little things that seem like you absolutely have to have those. But the reality is you don't. And, um, you know, I know I've fell prey to it so many different times and uh, because I like gadgets, you know, I I really do. Um, And I've helped you fall into that trap. Uh, When we first got started and decided we were going to do a long distance hike, um, I thought I knew it all and um, I could save us from those traps. And come to find out, I definitely didn't know it all. I actually knew very little. Uh, I had a lot of background in camping, but camping and backpacking are two very different things. And for me, I thought that I was also really good at backpacking because I've put stuff in a backpack and went camping with it. Again, that is not real backpacking. No, it's not. And I think you, you know, you learn over time and it's really fun to go into these outfitter stores and oh, see, yeah. see all of the stuff and it's dazzling and you want so much of it. But if you're getting started, if you, if you've never hiked and you want to start doing day hikes, I don't think you need to buy anything to start. I think if you have a good athletic shoe and a backpack um, that you use maybe, you know, for other reasons, you'll be fine on a day hike because a, a, a short day hike you don't really have to invest a whole lot of time and, and, and energy uh, and money. But if you do one day hike and two day hikes and you go, wait a minute, I love this. I want to do this regularly. Then it's time to start thinking about um, investing in, in shoes and a few other things. Yeah, I, I think shoes are probably the number one thing that people uh, take for granted. And uh, in my opinion, it's the most important investment that you'll make with this because that is your conveyance. That's what moves you through the wilderness. And if your feet are unhappy, you will be unhappy. So getting a good pair of shoes is uh, priority number one. Uh, I highly recommend going in to, uh, you know, a reputable outfitter or, uh, you know, a running store or something like that that so that you can go in there and get fitted for these shoes. Yeah, that's crucial. You really need to get fitted. You know, um, there are plenty of magazines and websites that recommend the best new shoes. And I'm sure all of those recommendations are terrific, but they may not be terrific for your feet. And you may wear, you know, one size in shoes regularly, but you, if you're getting an athletic shoe, you may need to size up and you really want to be in a store where they specialize in getting you a good fit. And it's also important to um, check out their return policy. A lot of running stores and outfitter stores will give you a window of time to you to wear the shoes and see if they're a good fit. And if they're not, they'll let you bring them in in exchange for another pair um, that may fit you better. And I think it also depends um, on preference, what kind of shoes you buy. It doesn't have to be hiking boots. I think we all have this idea that I'm going on a hike. I need to put on my hiking boots. And I did. When we first hiked, I had a pair of hiking boots and I put them on and I would wear them, but they really were not as, um, they didn't have the maneuverability that I wanted. So So I've switched to um, a good trail running shoe. That's what I like to hike in. But it's really personal preference. Yeah, I I couldn't agree more because, uh, you know, coming from a background where I spent a lot of time in the woods and particularly during hunting season, um, I would always have a good pair of hunting boots. Still want those when I'm uh, doing that kind of an activity. Yeah. And you also mentioned, um, you know, the sizing is uh, uh very important because sizing for hiking is different than just for um, walking or running or maybe even just day hiking. Because if you hike for more than a day, um, your feet are going to swell. So you need a little extra space there. And also too, 
um, you know, the socks that you wear are going to take up a little bit of space, possibly more space, because me personally, I like to wear two pairs of socks. I like to have a ultra light, uh, very thin pair of socks close to my skin. And then I like some type of a smart wool or merino wool kind of sock on the outside. Um, it adds that extra layer of cushion. Um, wool maintains its insulating properties, whether it is wet or not. So, uh, you know, in the winter, they're going to keep you warm. In the summer, they're going to keep you cool. Uh, I just, uh, I love that wool sock, uh, thin sock combination. Yeah, I, I agree that socks are, another thing to think about if you're if you are going to start doing regular day hikes shoes are at the top of the list but socks are something that i overlooked initially but i think they're worth thinking about right off the bat it's part of that keep those feet happy for me just having a seamless sock is really important oh yeah um because you know cut down on any friction around your foot because that's how blisters happen you know friction or right. moisture can cause blisters and we all get blisters on the trail at some point in our hiking lives you're going to have um a blister but the better your sock the better your shoe the better chance you don't get them or you get fewer of them yeah, I, I agree. And you mentioned blisters, which brings me to the next thing that I think everybody needs to really think about when they go out, and that is a first aid kit. I don't care if you're going for a day hike or whether you're going for multi-days, you need to have a good first aid kit on you. It doesn't need to be something that is over the top. I highly discourage against those prefabricated uh, first aid kits. You know, they're, they're great first aid kits to throw in your car or have in your house. But when you hit the trail, think about what you're actually going to be encountering. For us, we have a very simple first aid kit that we pull together on a day hike. We'll take one of those with us. If we're going multi-day, we'll each have one in our backpack. Um, this list, you can find it on our website, insidetheoutsideshow.com. Look under the menu. The uh, download is free. It's called The Essentials. It's a backpacking list that we use for the entire trip. But inside that, you'll find our first aid kit that we've tailored for our particular situation. Yeah, and that could give you a starting point for yours. But definitely make your first aid kit serve you. And you don't have to have any special containers or anything like that. We usually use um, a Ziploc baggie um, for them. I like kids' pencil cases. I think they work really well because you're just tucking in a few Band-Aids, some uh, Neosporin or ibuprofen, but not bottles and, and containers of these things, just small doses of them. And um, I do like to have one of those Mylar heat blankets. I think that makes me feel safe having one of those in my first aid kit. You know, I've never used one, but I always have one with me. I think it's one of those things, just like your first aid kit in general. I want it just in case, but I hope I never need it. Yeah, I've I've never actually used one either, knock wood. Um, I, and I hope I never have to, but I do like having it. It just feels um, that sense of security. Safety blanket, yeah. if you will. It's like that little <laughs> sense of security, knowing that okay, if things get really terrible, I've got this and, and I'll be okay. But I do think, a, a you know, a down and dirty, lightweight, just the essentials first aid kit is really important to have. Something else you need to consider, regardless of whether you're going on a long distance hike or a day hike, is hydration. You've got to have some water with you. You're going to get thirsty. Don't take it for granted. Don't think, oh, I'm going to be out for just a few minutes or maybe 30 minutes or something like that. Um, you know, something could happen, whether it be an injury or whether you take a wrong turn on a trail. Um, you're going to get thirsty and you need to have that with you. It's just do it. Um, for us, we usually take, you know, a single liter uh, bottle of water. It's an over-the-counter bottle of water. That will do you for a, an easy day hike. If we're going on a multi-day hike, we'll take a couple of them and refill along the way. But uh, you have to allow for a certain amount of hydration. You do. But don't think you have to buy something. So we did. We have we both have Camelback water bladders and um, used those for a long time. But... Um, Carrying a, a water bladder full of water gets really heavy and cumbersome, and um, and we just stop doing that. You don't need a water bladder. You don't have to invest in a water bladder. You can really just get two sturdy um, plastic bottles of water, keep them with you, and you'll be good. Just make sure you take water, even if you think, oh, it's a day hike. I'm not even. I'm doing a mile. It's not going to be any big deal. You never know when you'll need some water and you don't want to get dehydrated or in a difficult situation. And I, I did that once before. I've told this story several times. My son, when he, when he was younger, he and I were riding our mountain bikes in a local park and we were on a great 
even, smooth, flat trail. We thought we'd be 30 minutes. We left the water in the car because we weren't going to need it. We weren't going to ride that far. And we ended up making a wrong turn on the trail and ended up on a really arduous, difficult trail. And our 30-minute ride turned into a two-hour ordeal and we didn't have water <laughs> and we ran into some other mountain bikers who did have extra water and and bailed us out but you know you don't want to rely on on others on to, luck. to yeah on luck on dumb luck to get you through so always take the water no matter what but you don't have to you don't have to invest in anything and really if you're a day hiker and you want to maybe you're planning to go every weekend on a day hike investing in good shoes having some good socks putting together your personal first aid kit and making sure you always have water, you're set. You don't need to buy anything else. Yes. Uh, you can do this very inexpensively and make sure that that's, you know, something that you're going to love before right. you hit the trail for a multi-day hike. Right. And and you'll enjoy it. And it's a low bar of entry to get into um, this sport of hiking and just getting out into the woods and enjoying it. So um, I hope that many people will. We, we, I saw an article the other day that said hiking is the new yoga. So yes, <laughs> apparently hiking is becoming very, very popular. But if, if you're one of those people who goes, yeah, I want to do this. I think this will be terrific. Those are the only things you need to get started. Yeah. So let's talk about multi-day hikes. You're going to need the same items that we've already talked about, but you're going to have to have a few other considerations. Hydration, for instance, you know, we converted over, so we're never carrying more than two liters at any given time. That's an acceptable amount of weight, and it's always getting lighter. As soon as you fill it up, you're going to start drinking it, so it's always getting lighter. Um, and then ever so often, uh, you plan your trip accordingly so that you can stop and you can filter that water. Personally, I like to saw your mini squeeze because I can screw it on the top of a bottle if I need a quick shot of water, or I can also use my old water bladder empty Take it, scoop up some water and uh, connect it to the Sawyer Mini and make a gravity filter where it can be filtering my water while I'm having lunch or doing something else. It's so, so nice to have that working for you. Right. And on a day hike, you can carry the water you need. But on multi-day, you cannot carry the water you're going to need. Or should so, you even consider it? <laughs> no, no, you shouldn't even think about it. So you will need a water filtration system and you need to know where you're hiking. It's really important. So you can you can gauge where water is going to be. And it's worth um, checking in when you start a multi-day hike to make sure with the rangers, hey, are there any water situations? Are there things I need to know? Has anything changed? Um, yeah, because, because whenever you look at a map, it might show a water source um, in a particular location, but you don't know that they might be experiencing a drought condition. Or like um, when we did our Shenandoah hike, um, there wasn't a problem with water because they had had flooding. And we ended up having to change our route when we got there. We talked to the uh, rangers and found out that we um, ended up having to change several of the trails that we were planning on using. So water wasn't a problem, but the trail uh, you know, conditions were a different problem. So take advantage of those rangers they're out there day in and day out they know exactly what's going on on that trail yeah and they can certainly help and especially with water you you just can't play play games with it it's called backpacking so the thing you need is a backpack now on a day hike you can have a little backpack that you've bought for some different purpose. Totally. It'll be fine. Anything but, that you want that you can throw on your back and carry yeah, something is that, totally fine. That's fine for even 10 miles and less in a day. But if you're doing a multi-day hike and you have to carry everything you need on your back, you really have to get a backpack. You have to get one that has a frame and is adjustable and helps distribute that weight Otherwise, it's just pure agony. Definitely. And, you know, there's a huge debate in the backpacking world about whether an internal frame or an external frame is best. I'm not going to go down that road. I personally like the internal frames, but if you like an external frame, go for it. There's not a problem at all with it. So the backpack is part of what they call the big three when it comes to these overnight and multi-day hikes. So the big three is your backpack, your sleeping system, and your shelter. So when it comes to picking out a backpack, just like your shoes. It's an area where you definitely want to invest a little bit of time to go in, try these on. Don't just randomly buy a backpack off the internet because it looks cool or it was highly recommended by an article or something like that. You need to know how it's going to feel on your back and you need to go in, get fitted, Try it out. Most places will have weights that you can put in the backpack, walk around the store a little bit, see how it feels. And then once you buy that backpack, 
Take it out on a day hike. Um, put everything in it that you would expect to take on this multi-day hike and hike around in a local park or a neighborhood trail or something like that so that you can see how this feels and learn how to uh, adjust those straps. They'll help you with that in the uh, store whenever you're getting fitted for it. But it really does make a lot of difference for you to go out there and experience what it's like to have to adjust this on the fly. It really does. The backpack itself and the shoes... I think are the most two most important items if you're going to be a hiker or a, a multi-day hiker. They're the two critical things because they're the things that carry the weight. Yes. And if your feet are unhappy, it's hard to muster a pack. And if your shoulders and your back are hurting, it's hard to keep going. And having a properly fitted and adjusted pack will take uh, that burden off of your shoulders. So it's definitely worth um investing time and research and energy into it. And again, go to your local outfitting store and try them on and check that return and exchange policy Definitely. also because most of them will also give you a, a period to try out the pack and still have an opportunity to exchange it if it's not possibly the right one for you. And something else you can do, these uh, a lot of these outfitters will actually have rental uh, gear. So if you aren't entirely sure, and maybe you're just going to test drive this whole uh, overnight hiking thing out, go in there and rent a pack. Um, you'll still get an opportunity to try it on, get it fitted, and they'll have multiple options for you. And then the other thing is, is how are you going to sleep? Do you want a tent or do you want a hammock? Those are really um, the two options. And then on certain trails, there are also trail shelters like the AT through the Smoky Mountains. There are trail shelters and they actually want you in the trail shelters and not in a tent. Or yeah, a they, they discourage it's only in emergency situations. Do they want you uh, yeah. actually sleeping, you know, out on the ground or, uh, you know, hanging in the, the trees or whatever? Right. Um, the AT has a lot of shelters on it. A lot of your national forests yeah. and uh, trail systems you know, will have these shelters, but, um, you know, don't always count on those shelters. Even in the uh, Smoky Mountains, they tell you they want you in the shelters, but these shelters during certain times of the year, depending on the Appalachian Trail traffic, can get really packed with people. And what if you do, you know, what do you do if you show up there and the whole shelter is packed? You're going to have to go out and, uh, you know, set up your tent or hang your hammock and, and sleep. So you always want to have that with you. Um, another thing about the trail shelters is even if they're empty, they're never empty. There's always little guests that are there. Yeah, I the AT in the Smokies does have some of the nicer trail shelters. Yeah, um, but even nicer trail shelters have mice, and um, I remember mice skittering over us. It was <laughs> horrifying. I don't really like trail shelters. My preference is to never be in a trail shelter. And, and, if and I, the same here. I, I would yeah. much more prefer to be in my hammock. Um, yeah. You know, there's a huge debate about whether you're a ground dweller or a tree dweller. I've slept in a tent more times than I could possibly count. But once I discovered hammock camping, I'm not going back to the ground. I won't debate the, you know, the merits of either one of them. That's not uh, for this podcast. Maybe we can do one on that later on. But, you know, regardless of whether you carry a tent or whether you carry a hammock, make sure that you know how to use it. Set it up at your house multiple times. Set it up, tear it down. And then when you pack for the trail, double check, triple check that you've got everything with you. I know I've ran off a couple times without my rain fly. When I get back from any trip, I always take my rain fly and hang it out so that that way I can make sure it's completely dry so that when I pack it up, I don't get any mold or anything like that, you know, in my pack. And um, sometimes I've ran off without it. And I've also ran off into the woods, set up my tent and be like, oh, I, I can deal with it. Um, whether it's dew or rain, you're going to get wet. So have that rain fly with you. Yeah, that's that's important. So, and, and I agree. I like the hammock better than a tent, just because um, they haven't made the um, the bed roll, the bed pad that makes me comfortable laying on the ground. Like something just hurts when you wake up in the morning. And, and, and you know that hammock, bed pad is a hammock. really good uh, point. Um, if you're sleeping on the ground, you need to be insulated from that ground. So take a bed pad. It's going to give you a cushion to lay on, but it's also going to insulate you from the ground so that you don't get cold. I promise if you don't have a bed pad, whether you're in the shelter or whether you're laying on the ground, you're going to get cold. And, you know, I think... Before you even get cold, you're going to be uncomfortable if you don't have a pad of some sort because you do need a bed pad if you're using uh, a trail shelter because they're wood slats. Yeah, you know, you're, they're you're, hard. Yeah, they're not comfortable. So you need a bed pad for that. 
So now we're talking about um, the sleeping pad um, providing comfort and also insulation. This brings us to the last of the big three, which is your um, sleeping system. Now we call it a system because it's a combination of a couple things. If you're going to be sleeping on the ground, you want that pad to insulate you from the ground and it's going to provide some comfort and you know that insulation is going to help keep you warm. You're going to probably be in a sleeping bag. You could use a, a, a quilt in this situation, but most people go with a sleeping pad, sleeping bag combination. Regardless of you know whether you use a quilt or a sleeping bag, you need to make sure that it is rated for a temperature that is at least equal to or a little further beyond what you think the coldest situation is going to be that you're in. Yeah, I think we need to clarify the word quilt because yeah, I think yeah. if you're listening and you hear quilt, you think a quilt grandma's that grandma. Quilt. <laughs> so you know, no, you're not carrying a blanket like that into the woods. That's a lot of weight, and um, and you don't want that in your pack. It, there right. are um, for hammocks, there are over quilts and under quilts that and fit you can around use your the hammock. quilt uh, with your uh, sleeping uh, in place of your sleeping bag if you're sleeping on the you ground. Could. But really, what what a quilt boils down to is a, a sleeping bag without a zipper on it. Yeah. So you can throw it over you. Um, you could wrap it around you like it would be a sleeping bag, or you can just throw it over top of you. Either way, I like the quilt too because if you wanted to, you could grab it and wrap it around your shoulders and sit by the fire with it. Um, you know, it's I find it a little more versatile than a sleeping bag. But it's the same lightweight material as a sleeping bag, the same sort of filling as a sleeping bag, the same sort of warmth um, ratings as a sleeping bag. Yeah. And and I use the underquilt and overquilt on my hammock year round because I don't, to me, I'm always, always cold. cold. In the, I'm always cold in the woods. <laughs> you have I'm an just, electric blanket in our bed right now and uh, you've had it there all summer even. Um, so well, it's, it's because the air conditioning is turned down really low in this house. But well, anyway, like um, I'm cooler. always, I'm always cold. <laughs> so I use the over quilt and under quilt all year round. I think they weigh, both of them weigh just several ounces and you can compact them into your pack. So they take up very little space. Um, but that's the sleep system that I prefer. If you love a backpack, I mean a sleeping bag, same thing. It's compactable. You can fit it into your um, bag. Just make sure you have that pad. Yeah, just like with tents and hammocks and the huge debate over which is better, same thing comes with uh, your uh, sleeping uh, system, whether you use uh, synthetic material or uh, some natural material like down feather. Um, you know, regardless of what you use, make sure that it's something that you can live with the weight of and the compressibility of. I personally like the synthetic materials. I think they compress down much smaller. My personal under and over quilt will both compress together down to smaller than a football. So, um, you know, I, I like that. Um, yours, uh, Christy, is a little bit bigger. It's probably double the size of mine because you wanted that added insulation, but it still compresses down significantly smaller than the down milk military uh, mummy bag that you had when we first went out on the trail. Yeah, that bag was ridiculous. I don't even want to talk uh, about that bag. A little bit. <laughs> that, was, that bag was a mess. But um, but yeah, it's compactable. A and I think it depends, your sleep system depends on the terrain because yeah. we're here in the east. So we have beautiful deciduous forest and hammock camping is really easy here because every right. place we go has trees and lots of trees. But if you're in different terrain, um, you know, hammock camping isn't going to work. So that's something you have to think about. Too. Without a doubt. If you're doing desert hikes or some of the hikes out west, um, you know, you're not going to pitch a hammock up. It's just not going to work. Right. But even in those situations, you're going to want to have a way to insulate uh, and cushion your body from the ground. Uh, Absolutely. You know, because deserts get cold at night. They do. Um, you know, and something else just to touch real quick on with the hammock sleep system. When we first started, I read all these articles about, oh, you have to have something to insulate you from below. And I really just, for whatever reason, my brain said, nah, not really. And uh, I'll tell you, even at temperatures down around 70 to 75 degrees, you'll get cold. I was amazed. You get what they call the cold butt syndrome. And uh, I experienced it firsthand whenever we went out and immediately thought, okay, I still don't think I need a quilt. I'll, I'll just put a pad because some people would say, oh, you can put a sleeping pad in your hammock and it'll be just fine. Okay. It did work. I stayed warmer, but I had cold spots because throughout the night, the pad continued to move around on me and uh, I didn't get a good night's sleep because I was constantly waking up adjusting the pad because I'd get a cold spot. 
Then I finally broke over and put an underquilt under me, and I was like, my life was changed right then. I had found the ultimate sleeping and shelter system. I loved being up off the ground, not having to worry about whether the train was level or whether there were rocks, and I was always insulated and warm, um, snug as a bug in the rug, you might say. You have to find what works for you and what you're comfortable with and what keeps you warm and cozy in the woods. And it's critical that you have to test all of these things out before you ever step foot in the woods. One thing that I personally love, whether I'm on the trail or not, is food. Anybody that knows me knows that uh, I just like food. I, I don't like a particular kind of food, and I don't like a particular style of cooking. I just like food. So when I'm on the trail, I want to eat good food. But on the trail is totally different than cooking at home. So what would you say is one of your favorite meals for the trail? Well, my favorite, and this this evolved because when we first um, started doing multi-day hikes, I, my biggest worry truly was that I was going to be hungry. I was going to be out in the woods starving and there was going to be yeah. no food. There wasn't going to be enough food. So I overpacked food. I put all of my thought towards the food and didn't think as much as I should have about my pack <laughs> or my sleeping bag or those critical pieces. Now I know the food is the is important, but it's not the most important thing. We sort of evolved into this first day trail meal tradition, and that is we have um, nachos for our first day lunch. And it happened by accident one time because we were driving several hours to get on a trail, and we had stopped and bought some snacks. and And when we got out at the trail, we had this bag of tortilla chips and Gary's like, well, I'm just going to take them into the woods. And I'm like, We're, they're going to get smashed. They're not going to survive. Why are you doing this? And um, that evening for dinner is when we had them actually. Yeah. I, I, so it looked kind of funny to anybody yeah. that we were passing because I didn't want these to get crushed. So I tied them to the outside of my pack and I, I told her, I said, you know, we've got to eat these today because the, they're definitely not going to make it through a second day. No. And we stopped for dinner that night. We were so tired. And, but we had, you know, a, a, a dehydrated meal to make and we were boiling water for it. And then we're like, wait a minute, let's just eat those chips. And we had found these cheese pouches. They're made by Velveeta. They're not, I'm, this isn't sponsored. They're not paying us to talk about their cheese pouches, but I they, wish have they, would, these, though. <laughs> they have these little pouches of cheese. <laughs> you can get them on Amazon and they're, they're about the size of a single serve tuna packet. So they're highly portable. And we had gotten those and we had the chips, so we dug those out and ended up just eating um, nacho cheese. And after that, it was like, oh, my gosh, we have to have this first day every single trip because yep. there's something about the comfort of nachos and the salt after your first day that you really, really enjoy. Yeah, on that first day, you're just your body is getting acclimated to the trail and what you're about to, you know, undertake for the next day or two or week or whatever. And uh, your body is always going to be craving that salt because you're sweating so much. Yeah. And to have these nice, comforting, cheesy, salty nachos, um, it, it's wonderful. But it is something that you know it's a, it's our first day tradition and something that you know it replaces that whole dinner process of having to get out the stove and, you know, boil water and all that stuff. So, you know, that first day becomes so much easier because we don't have to worry about any form of cooking. We just get to where we're going to go and pop out the nachos. And my God, it's, it's heaven. It really is. And it's funny because I, I feel like a lot of food that you eat on the trail is food in your normal life. You wouldn't eat. Um, <laughs> you don't like freeze dried dinners. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I love nachos. But, you know, nothing against Velveeta, but these cheese packs I've never eaten in non-trail life, and I, I never want to. They're perfect for the trail, <laughs> but in real life, um, there are other options that I like better. Um, the freeze-dried meals, there are lots of great freeze-dried meals, and we've had some terrific ones. Um, but, you know, I, I never – some of the combinations I just don't even eat otherwise. But, you know, trail is a special place. Now we have that tradition as our first day sure. meal, but a lot of people will um, have post hike meal tradition. Yeah, like a reward for having yeah. achieved it. I know one of my favorite YouTube uh, backpackers is Syntax, and um, he, I recommend checking out his hiking uh, videos. He, he does a really good job of talking through uh, scenarios and helping you pack and enjoy your uh, hikes. And um, he always ends his hikes with going and finding cheeseburgers uh, at the closest place he can find. And while that's wonderful, um, our tradition has become that first day meal and then – 
you know, you're always ravenous when you get off the trail and we go out and, you know, find some kind of food. Yeah. Our post hike meal can be uh, many different things. It depends on what the hike was like, the thing you're craving. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, it's whatever often, you're craving. It's often pizza, but you know, and I have a friend who, <laughs> who he and his wife day hike a lot and they always end it with ice cream. They find ice cream somewhere. So um, those rewards are nice. They just become part of your trail story. Yeah. We'd love to hear whatever your traditions are. Feel free to uh, comment on any of our social media. We're on Facebook. We're on Instagram. We're on YouTube. Love to hear from you. Post some pictures or some comments about whatever your pre-hike, post-hike, you know, during the hike, whatever. We'd love to hear from you. That does it for this podcast. Thanks for joining us. We hope you enjoyed it, and if you did, be sure to subscribe and leave us a review. For show notes and pics and other cool things, check out our website, InsideTheOutside.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Look for the handle Inside the Outside Show. And if you have show ideas or just want to chat, you can email us at InsideTheOutsideShow at gmail.com. Until the next time, we hope to see you outside. <laughs>